Okay, so welcome everyone to today's session as part of the Climate Expo Conference on Building Resilience into the Future, Adaption and Resilience, uh, following today's theme of the Conference of Adaption and Resilience. So I am Samantha Francis, I'm the Deputy Director for Research Base at the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council, which is part of UKRI. My role includes strategic oversight of our resilience portfolio. So I'm really looking forward to today's discussion and it's a real pleasure to be able to host today's panel session. So during the next hour, we're gonna be discussing the next wave of world-class research and innovation focused on adaption and resilience to climate change. We will be exploring interdisciplinary research and the ability to anticipate, adapt and respond to changes, whether they are natural, man-made, short or long-term, local or global. I'm really pleased to be joined by an excellent multidisciplinary panel to guide us through this topic. And um, before I introduce them, I just want to run through a little bit of housekeeping. We will be recording today's session and it will be available um, after the, today's event on the website. And we will be taking questions for the panel as well. So please do put them in the Q&A function that you can see on your screen. The format we'll have is we'll have about 30 to 40 minutes of panel discussion before I open it up to your questions, but the panel is really keen to hear from you, so please do feed in your questions and we hope we can get to them a bit later. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our panel and I'm really pleased to be joined today by five inspirational leaders in their fields. The first person I'd like to introduce is Dr. Katie McQuaid. She is a senior research fellow in the School of Geography at the University of Leeds and is also a UKRI Future Leaders Fellow. She is an anthropologist with expertise on climate change, gender and sexuality, aging and human rights in informal urban settings. So well, thank you, Katie, welcome along today. She will be joined by Dr. Christina van der Waal. She is also a UKRI Future Leaders Fellow and an Associate Professor in Experimental Fluid Mechanics at the University of Southampton. As part of her fellowship, she is currently applying her research to si simulate urban wind patterns and how air pollution is spread in cities. Our third panelist is Dr. Adrian Healy from the School of Geography and Planning at Cardiff University. He is currently exploring themes of urban resilience and access to water in sub-Saharan Africa. He has published widely on the theme of regional and urban resilience and is a member of the Water Research Institute at Cardiff University. I'd also like to introduce Dr. Eva Brophy, who holds a joint appointment between the Smith School and the Said Business School at the University of Oxford. Aoife's research focuses on the role of the private sector and innovation in addressing interconnected sustainable development challenges. She has recently completed an ESRC project on energy access in sub-Saharan Africa, where her work explores business models and new forms of collaboration between governments, the private sector and communities. And the last panel, panelist I'd like to introduce is Dr. Benish Siddiq, who is the founder and CEO of AEH Innovative Hydrogel Limited. Benish is a successful entrepreneur. She has a background in chemistry and materials and has also won awards for her innovative work. AEH Innovative Hydrogel is a startup company based at the University of Manchester, oh, excuse me, and has begun trials of a graphene enhanced growth material that could revolutionize food production. So welcome everyone to today's session and as an opener and a chance to introduce yourselves to everyone, I'd like to ask you, what is your biggest research question at the moment in relation to today's topic? And what's that niggle that's at the back of your mind that makes things exciting for you in the morning? So the first person I'd like to open up to is Katie. Thanks very much for your introduction, Sam. Um, really pleasure to be here today. Um, my big research question is around gender equality and climate change and how we ensure climate actions, particularly um, around adaptation and resilience, are as inclusive and equitable as possible. Um, so this is about reaching uh, the most marginalized communities and ensuring that we're raising both their profile and participation um, in these spaces. 
Um, so I run the Generate project, um, which is part of my UKRI Future Leaders Fellowship at the University of Leeds. And what that's doing is looking at the gender, age, urban interface of climate change. So this is understanding how um, experiences of climate change, vulnerabilities to climate change, are shaped by gender, shaped by age, and shaped by sexuality in urban settings. So I'm gonna be working in secondary cities because a lot of climate programs are often focused on, on capital cities. Um, so I'm working in six secondary cities between uh, Uganda and Indonesia. Um, what we're doing in our investigations is bringing together researchers, artists and activists uh, to generate data and generate understanding on how gender, age and sexuality are shaping um, ability to adapt to climate change. It's a way of setting up a collaborative methodology that brings um, the most marginalized communities right into the knowledge production process. Um, and then once we've generated this data, we're looking at, at, at bringing insights from above, uh, policymakers, urban planners, um, practitioners, policy um, uh, politicians, we're gonna bring uh, those above perspectives together with the perspectives from the ground. And we're gonna try and build um, bridges and links using arts. Um, so bringing artists, bringing activists, uh, generating ways in which we can really engage um, these communities um, in the climate action process. Um, so we're, um, we've been a little uh, set back by the, the current um, circumstances, but we're about to um, hit the ground um, and start that process going. Um, so yeah, I'm really pleased to be here. Excellent. Thank you, Katie. And what an interesting kind of diverse range of people that you want to bring together there. It's going to be really interesting to talk about later on today. Um, so the next person I'd like to ask that question to is Christina. Uh, thanks. I have a slide that I'd like to share. So I'll share my screen now and hopefully you can see that. Yeah, yep. super. Um, so as Sam said, I'm in engineering and my expertise is really all about aerodynamics and wind tunnel testing, but we're using our facilities now to study urban airflow patterns. So my big research question is uh, all about how do individual buildings change the local wind flow? Um, and how do we incorporate those local effects into our larger scale numerical weather prediction and climate models? Um, so maybe you've been sit walking through the city before and you turn a corner and you get hit by a gust of wind and it knocks you over. Um, so we should be able to predict that that's gonna happen before we build the building. And we wanna know how that also impacts how air pollution is spread around the city. So on this slide, I showed some pictures of uh, scale models that we've done in our wind tunnel and water tunnel facilities, um, and as well as results of a computer simulation from a fire that happened in Southampton a while ago. And also we got some brand new uh, water tunnel and wind tunnel facilities there that we're quite excited about. Now, of course, we can't work in isolation, so I have one more slide here about this um, a bigger network that I'm part of. So the Breathing City Future Urban Ventilation Network is a UKRI funded um, research network under NERC's Strategic Priority Fund. And it's a forum of academics like me, but also industry who are interested in urban wind flow patterns and ventilation. And so um, hopefully I'll be able to reflect what I've learned through this network and sharing my knowledge um, as we do this discussion today. And if anybody's interested in learning more about this network, uh, all the details are at breathingcity.org. So I'll stop sharing there. Thank you very much. Um, that's some really great things to delve into as well about you know, resilience of cities. Um, okay, so um, Adrian, I'll hand over to you now to just introduce your big research question. Thanks, Sam, and, and it is a real pleasure to be here uh, as well. As you, as you introduce things, I'm, I'm looking at the resilience of cities in sub-Saharan Africa to, to water shocks. Um, but more particularly, I'm interested in, in what we describe as the interface between individual agency and collective resilience outcomes. How do the choices that we make 
affect the resilience of the places in which we live and the resilience of others who live there as well. And so my research is focusing on, initially at least, on urban water supplies for domestic use. So working with collaborators in four cities that to cover different contexts in terms of climate, water supply infrastructures, the hydrogeology in which those, those cities are located, for example. And I'm working in, in Lagos in Nigeria, uh, in Vintuk in Namibia, Cape Town in South Africa, and Dodoma in, in Tanzania. Uh, and looking in particular at, at three questions. Firstly, how the individual actors respond to water shocks and water stress uh, on the ground on, on an everyday basis. What are the implications for that for collective resilience outcomes? And where the particular events influence long-term behavioural change as well, such as droughts or water stress for different reasons. And I think there are, are four dimensions to my work that we might find particularly relevant to our discussion today as well. Firstly, I'm always interested in the question of who is building resilience. And actually, we often overlook the role of individual actors, such as households or firms, when we think about resilience strategies and resilience actions. So as an example of that, Lagos relies on a very vibrant self-supply movement, whereby households invest in their own boreholes to secure their water supply, because the city infrastructure doesn't supply sufficient water. And we saw a similar pattern emerging in Cape Town following the announcement of day zero, as you remember from the 2018 drought that they had when the city was projected to run out of water. And if we recognize the role of individual actions, then it raises important questions as to what the end goals and motivations of those individuals are, whether those goals align with the goals of government. And those are the sorts of questions that I find really fascinating from them. How do individuals adapt to shocks and uncertainty and especially when that might be at odds with the aims of public authorities as well. And in doing so, that highlights how those actions of the many can have unintended consequences when realized in particular places, which really leads to a really important question about how that sum of individual adaptive actions might transform the systems themselves and potentially in ways that aren't intended. And so I suppose the thing that really gets me excited about all of this at the end um, is what that means for governance and, and how do we govern these distributed systems that are actually there in practice rather than assuming some sort of stable system uh, approach. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, I think there's links up and down from the individual up to kind of the governance level is actually very critical when you think about this topic. Um, so, yes, I hope we can talk about that a bit more. In detail. So um, the next person I want to hand over to is Aoife to introduce her work. Great, thanks a lot Sam and it's actually really nice to follow on from Adrian because I think um, the perspective that I take, I have a joint position between a business school and a school of geography and so um, the work that I do is always at this intersection between um, individual companies and systems um, and I think the role of business is, and the role of the private sector is incredibly important for the next steps that we take in addressing net zero and sustainable development. Um, but there's also a big disconnect between um, the focus on individual companies often um, and not a, a, a rich enough understanding of their role within very complex systems as Adrian has already um, um, illustrated. Um, and I think um, this kind of connection between um, business and um, the big systemic challenges um, that we have. That's what makes me excited um, to, to get up and to, um, to keep going with the, with the research um, that I'm doing every day. Um, and I think the big question for me is um, how can policies and, um, and governments um, encourage sustainable innovation? Um, I look at that um, by focusing on um, business models across different sectors and, um, and different geographies. Um, so I've done a lot of work in sub-Saharan Africa um, on energy access, but I also look at these questions um, in um, the UK context. Um, I've also looked at um, sustainable buildings and districts in, in Switzerland, um, uh, because I think we're all trying to, and all um, systems and across geographies, we're all trying to address many of um, the same kinds of questions um, that come back to um, lots of disconnects between um, actors and, and different goals. Um, and business models for me are, are an interesting way and a systemic way of thinking about um, these challenges because they answer a very fundamental question, which is what kind of value are we providing to different people and to different communities? 
Um, and the work that we've been doing, for example, in, in Sub-Saharan Africa um, for energy access has focused on um, new types of business models that have been emerging over the last decade. Um, we still have 600 million people in Sub-Saharan Africa that don't have access to basic forms of, of energy. Um, we've seen huge innovation in the last decade in um, very cost um, effective um, ways of providing energy access through small solar home systems, for example, which have um, rapidly diffused used um, across many different countries. Um, but at the same time, many of those systems are only providing basic forms of energy access to people. So um, basic forms of lighting and, um, and maybe appliance charging. Um, what we've been studying is um, innovation that um, goes beyond these basic forms of access um, and looks at community-led um, uh, approaches um, that provide, for example, um, access to um, electricity for lighting and, and appliances in homes, but also things like refrigeration so that um, fishers in different regions in Uganda can um, make sure that they're the fish that they um, that they harvest um, doesn't um, spoil, and so it enables them to be able to um, to to earn more money for the produce that they um, they are um, um, harvesting. Um, we've um, been studying companies that are offering um, services that combine um, energy with um, what's um, referred to as productive use, um, so electricity that is being used for um, uh, refrigeration um, for these um, fishers, for example. Um, and also agro -proce processing, which can add um, employment in different regions, in different um, countries, and build resilience in communities. Um, so we're looking at the role of, of the private sector in being able to push for these uh, more innovative models um, that, um, that connect the dots actually between um, this problem that Adrian um, already identified, this disconnect between individual companies and, um, and, um, and systems. And I think this um, is really important um, to, to get our heads around. There's lots of really interesting um, questions that we can ask um, fundamentally to um, not be focused on individual sustainable development goals, but think thinking about communities and what they need and bringing all of the, you know, the, the interesting um, questions that we're looking at together in some way as we go forward. Excellent, thank you very much. Um, and last but not least, I'd just like to ask Benish, what makes you excited in the morning and your, your research that you're undertaking? Thanks, thanks um, uh, for inviting me for this talk. So firstly, I mean, I'll just go uh, with the question, I mean, research question that excites me uh, more. So it is about sustainability related to food production. Uh, and the overall aim, our overall the question we are tackling is how to make UK self-reliant on food supply, uh, with uh, self-reliant on food. So for example, uh, uh, if I give an example of spinach, because lots of us love to eat spinach. So at the moment, UK has like supply chain of spinach uh, for 26 weeks, but its requirement is for 52 weeks. So what we are doing, we are trying to tackle how to make uh, this supply chain uh, for like 52 weeks. And the way we are tackling this issue, uh, we have developed a certain types of indoor farming system that makes sure that we can grow crops or spinach or other leafy greens uh, by using less resources, less water, less energy, or, and even like by using more sustainable uh, substrate or substrate uh, or medium. So the other way uh, we are tackling this issue is like, uh, the, uh, the other way we are making UK more reliant on self is like, for example, leafy greens flown from Spain to Manchester has a significantly larger carbon footprint than it's shipped from Manchester to Manchester. So here in Manchester, we are growing um, fresh leafy uh, greens and it's supplying to uh, Manchester and other cities as well. So thanks. Excellent, thank you very much. So, I mean, that's definitely got my brain neurons firing. I thought uh, there's lots of questions I'd like to ask, but I, I'm gonna kind of stick to some of that um, we that kind of covering the topic of today. So I want to kind of kick off and ask Christina and Benish actually to start us off. But, you know, obviously today's, um, or this week's conference is building up to COP26. So as we move towards COP26, what should our adaption ambition look like and what more is needed to drive a strong post-COP26 adaption and resilience agenda? So 
Christina, would you like to go first, thinking about that question? Sure. Um, for me, I think it's important for us to realize that the majority of the world is now living in cities, in urban centers, and this is the part of the world that has the worst air pollution. And so I think a really important step is to recognize that air pollution has impacts on health and the health of the people living in those cities. And we made a lot of progress in this last year when the coroner's report um, identified that the death of a nine-year-old girl in London was officially linked to the air quality in her neighborhood. And I think if we identify this link, then moving forward, we can properly plan um, how to monitor and mitigate the air pollution um, in our urban centers and protect the health of our population. So that's one of my priorities to think about from this. And just to add from my side, so it is more related to again with full protection. So currently, for example, 9.9% .9 of 2018 greenhouse gas emissions were from agriculture and it's all uh, it's and the, it is due to basically the material fertilizer we use uh, to grow like these crops or like even like lots of uh, even in indoor farming for example uh, as uh, Christina mentioned most of us live in cities so at the moment like indoor farming is getting a lot of momentum although I mean it's a good solution uh, for like uh, it reduce food mileage obviously if there are uh, indoor farm or indoor if uh, if probably some of you are not aware of indoor farming, indoor farming is basically you go grow crops in uh, without using soil. So the overall vision uh, for indoor farming is to reduce food mileage, uh, to reduce carbon footprint, and all. Well, we had to have one technical hitch at least. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, you're back with us. Uh, okay, so the biggest uh, thing which I want to, uh, uh, sorry, again, it's internet connection is in, um, so biggest challenge, I mean, which I am uh, looking like after 2026 is like, uh, we will grow uh, crops uh, by using indoor farming, but it's in more, uh, like, uh, in more sustainable way. So currently, I mean, indoor farming, um, there are lots of issues related. So for example, uh, it used, it's really energy intensive. And the other side, it used like lots of unsustainable substrate or growth media. So the way I am looking is like, yes, indoor farming will be a solution. There will be less food mileage, but it is in more sustainable way with less uh, carbon dioxide emissions or let's see. Yeah. And what role do you think government plays in, in, in some of this, you know, picking up that and thinking about resilience from a, um, a farming perspective, but also, Christina, from um, cities, you know, what role can government play and policymakers post COP26? Yeah, so uh, from my uh, from my side, so basically, uh, governments, uh, at the moment, I mean, to be honest with you, they are playing a good role in a way like they are providing funding. So, for example, uh, when you have a startup company, our company is funded by Innovate UK. So I have secured one million grants. So here, I mean, it's just like, OK, they provided uh, funding from research and now for adoptability. So there are policymakers. They can, uh, for example, peat is a substrate that is used in lots of indoor farming. So policymakers, they are thinking they will ban it once there is alternative substrate is available. So how fast they can act. So for example, if we are having a really sustainable or eco-friendly substrate, so policymakers, they can make sure like, uh, uh, for example, if you are bringing our substrate in 2022 or 2023, they should straight away ban it uh, instead of waiting for 2030, because at the moment they are waiting for 2030. And in the same way for cities, uh, they're, uh, like there need to be more investment. So that is something I mean, cities need to do. For example, Manchester is a good example. I can say, I don't even like, it's just really like they are investing on. So their net zero target is by 2038. Yes, we will be there. So it's just more like, uh, yes, they do. Uh, I mean, lots of people got, they do talk, but it's more like investment of money because that is the most important thing on more green technologies. So this is something. 
Thank you very much. Um, so Christina, was there anything else you wanted to, to add to, to that? Sure, yeah. Um, I would just say that I guess that it's really tough from a policy perspective to um, make recommendations for urban design and buildings um, because there's not just one factor at play. It's not just air pollution and air quality. There's also making sure it's well insulated so that we're warm, energy efficient, um, noise of noise, not noisy. Um, and so really we need to have a holistic approach to make these key decisions. Um, but one thing that has come out recently um, in terms of COVID safety is the importance of ventilation. So it's uh, hand space or hand space and the space is an important one. And so I think identifying that ventilation is important is going to be important then to incorporate into our building design moving forward and those will be concerns then will that need to be wrapped up in policy um, but it's not a clear answer there's no one solution which makes it tough yeah and i mean that's something we've actually been looking at as part of epsrc with other research councils is if you look at decarbonizing the built environment then you have these unintended consequences such as the ventilation of buildings um which as we've seen over the last year become um very critical um and i think you're picking up a point there as well about the importance of the individual in some of this the ecosystem and, and we talked about that in some of your introductions and i wanted to ask katie and Eva about the role diversity can play in helping us be resilient and respond to shock. Absolutely, I think um, recognizing diversity is, is hugely important and creating spaces um, for recognizing what that diversity looks like, um, who's affected in different ways, um, and also centralizing a lot of those knowledges. Um, so we've talked about, you know, the role that, that, that government can play and the role that policy can play, but equally there's, there's, a, there's a space in which we can recognize what's happening on the ground, what adaptations, what disaster risk reduction activities are happening, what innovations are happening in the grassroots levels, um, in, in, in particularly in urban spaces, we've been talking a lot about that today in, in the cities that are, a lot of us are living in and, and, and rapidly urbanizing between now and now and 2050. So how do we create spaces um, in which we can, we can build those bridges in which we can understand how um, ability to adapt about what the different needs are, uh, what the different urgencies are, who has access um, to the investment um, that is coming down. Um, you know, I've been having a lot of conversations recently with, with members of parliament in Uganda and there's, um, incredibly forward-looking um, in, uh, policies coming out, the new climate change bill, but how do, how do we implement that in different ways? And how do we um, give kind of ability and, and infrastructure to and, and knowledge to, to the city authorities themselves um, to, to, to create space to, to acknowledge both men and women, to acknowledge different um, abilities you know how do you how do you take space how do you access those cities how do you access how do you move around them um and 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 age is very important to me as well because a lot of uh, a lot of um cities have aging populations there's going to be a lot of migration into cities um so and and there's uh, the world health organization has been kind of looking at aging cities um, and how do we create kind of uh, spaces that are equitable for, for our older populations? But that's not very well represented um, across a lot of um, contexts in the global south. So kind of how do we build diverse, how do we build aging into diversity? Um, so I, I'll leave it there, but that's that's something I think that's actually really key when we, we, we are rethinking what knowledge we use to shape those policies um, and, and how we create and use it. Mm. Yeah, yeah, just picking up on um, some of what Katie has already um, mentioned, we've been doing a lot of work um, also in Uganda, in, in rural parts of Uganda, and trying to connect the dots between 
um, what people in local spaces understand about what's going on and, um, and some of the national policies that are being um, developed. Um, because as Katie mentioned, I mean, Uganda is actually really um, impressive, the, the policy um, infrastructure, particularly at a national level, um, but translating that down into um, different communities and recognizing that there are different needs in different parts of the country, um, that's, it's a very difficult challenge. Um, and it's not um, for a lack of vision or for a lack of commitment. Um, it's, um, it's really about kind of connecting and, and bridging um, different um, types of people, different types of communities and different actors as well. Um, we've been doing um, a lot of convening in Uganda and Zambia, bringing together um, different levels of policymakers um, from national down to um, local chiefs um, who are um, very important in, um, in their kind of local communities um, and know a lot about the needs of their people. Um, and then also um, companies um, and um, community members um, themselves um, to, to have conversations and to actually make sure that we are recognizing um, the diversity that is, um, that is going on. And even within kind of existing structures, then there are um, um, problems with um, power relations, um, some people being left out. Um, we've been working with a lot of women's um, um, self-help groups in different um, parts of Uganda and Zambia because they are um, very close to and often manage a lot of the household um, um, especially kind of energy related kind of um, cooking and um, um, and looking after kind of children in the home. Um, so making sure that we're kind of bringing voices that are also left out from even the existing kind of local structures, um, I think are, are just really important considerations as we move forward. And I think that's something that is as applicable in the UK as it is in, in Uganda um, and making sure we have both this kind of bottom up and top down um, approach um, to and to developing policies and um, not leaving people behind. Mm, I'd like to just add, if you don't mind, sorry, Sam, um, but to really build on, on what Aoife was saying, I think that's even more critical now um, when we've seen kind of the impacts of the pandemic, um, you know, in many contexts, but you look here in the UK um, about who has impacted most and, and, and it often is women um, and, and different types of women and recognizing diversity with, within women as well. Um, so I think there's a, there's a real intersection between the kind of the, the impacts of the pandemic um, and, and um, existing kind of power imbalances as well. Yes, definitely. I think that is very um, stark uh, evidence from the last 12 months well, plus really. Um, and I, I wanted to ask Adrian, I mean, you may want to take it in this direction or, or a different direction, but around what, what do you think is the biggest challenge for human society to adapt and build resilience regarding climate change? Thanks for asking me the small questions. <laughs> <laughs> Listening to the conversation so far uh, as well, what struck me is actually the biggest challenge is perhaps what sort of society that we want. I think there was a real question about what are we building resilience for? Um, is it to protect the status quo? Um, or do we want to do things differently to try to achieve different endpoints? I mean, at heart, resilience is really about responding to uncertainty. Um, it's not always a good thing. Very resilient societies can be holding a, 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 actually a, a kind of a very maladaptive position, a situation which is, uh, you know, extending inequality, for example, or, or entrenching power relations, which we perhaps in our values don't want to see from there. So I think one of the real challenges in terms of building resilience is, is building resilience, not just to what, but for what. You know, and I mean, I, I, it's glib phrases like building back better, you know, really strike to the heart of that. Building what back? What do we mean by better in that context? These are, these are great phrases. But what do we actually want? And most of the research we've been talking about, a lot of it has been not in the UK, but I think actually the lessons that we see in other cities and other contexts apply just as equally in the UK as well. Some of the work I've been doing recently with one of the water utilities is thinking about how do we construct a resilient water supply service over the next 50 years in the UK. They're thinking about it in terms of their own area of operations. But it raises really interesting questions about the shared responsibility. 
What do we move between places to protect those li living in other areas? Are we moving water from one location to another? In fact, actually, one of the challenges, I was looking at uh, one, of, one of the strategies that was published a few years ago at the national level, it was more about actually making sure there would be sufficient water in the southeast of England. That's a very positive thing to do, of course. Resilience to climate shocks, but also recognizing societal needs and so forth as well. But it doesn't ask the question, actually, is that the right way to go about this? Should we be looking to move water or should we thinking about, be thinking about how do we reuse water? How do we recycle water? How do we make sure our water use is more efficient in places rather than just trying to adapt to the immediate problem? So in terms of the big challenges, I think it's what sort of system do we want to, shall we say, transition to or transform to? And that I think is the, the conversation where government really comes in as well, as well as individuals. Government does a great job in terms of facilitating things, the sort of things that Benish highlighted earlier, but it also engenders conversation at its best and an open discussion dialogue about what is the future that we actually want and what are we making ourselves resilient for? Would anyone like to build on that quite large question really? Yeah, I'd, I'd just like to pick up on something that, that Adrian has mentioned, because I think this role of government um, is absolutely key in um, creating kind of this vision of, you know, what are we what are we actually kind of reaching for and what is resilience for? Um, a lot of the work that, that we've been doing has been pushing um, policymakers to, to not kind of think in, in silos, um, so not to necessarily think about um, you know, measuring success um, for energy access purely by um, how many people are connected to um, some form of energy, right? Because that doesn't really tell us anything about what people are using the energy for. Is it making their lives any better? Um, what do they want in the first place? Um, and, and so I think there's a real um, challenge for, um, for policymakers. And this is something that Christina mentioned at the, at the very beginning. It's very applicable to, to buildings and, and cities as much as it is to rural electrification. Um, we need to be thinking holistically about how we're actually measuring um, you know, our success in reaching whatever goals it is that we that we want to reach. Um, and you know, there are that's very challenging because we have to have a mix of these different ways of measuring and a mix of, um, of thinking um, about um, tracking that progress over time. Um, and some of those things are not very easy to, to measure as well. And we don't want to be leaving those things out, you know, especially kind of things related to, to diversity that, um, that Katie and I were, um, were talking about. So I think there's a, you know, a need to have these, the big picture asking these kind of, you know, what are we building for and making sure that we're not reducing things down to um, these easily kind of quantifiable um, metrics. Um, which I think is, you know, a really important role for, for government. And I think a question I have with my, and to be fair, this is with my own kind of work hat on, is the role that technology can play in all of this. So I'd be interested, I mean, Christina, um, and maybe Benish, you may have some thoughts on this, on where can technology help with um, resilience of climate change and, and some of these challenges we're facing about the society we want to create. Um, I guess I can start. So my research is really all about improving our capability of modeling um, wind patterns and air pollution. And my motivation for improving that technology, and the UK is a world leader in numerical weather prediction with the Met Office, um, but they can still improve their resolution. And we need the best tools available to make these predictions to base our decisions on is how I see it. So you can't make a decision without having a proper um, measurement and prediction of what's going on and the impact of that decision. Um, so that's where I think, yeah, technology for making predictions and understanding the situation can then um, help us make those decisions about what big um, changes we need to implement. Um, and one big change I see coming soon is um, our switch to electric cars in 2030. Um, right now, like that's gonna make a huge impact on the pollution that comes from transport. Um, and that is motivated because of, because of these, our understanding of how pollution uh, comes from different sources. And that's one of the big sources. So yeah, I think that's really important. 
Yeah, and I think there is also, there's something around there about how you help policymakers interpret that data as well and you present it in the right way, that it, it gets that right balance between lots of detail and, and then quite, you know, a, a, a summary kind of information. How do you help um, make those decisions by informed by data and evidence? Um, but Benita, I mean, your work is, um, you know, very innovative from a technology point of view. Yeah, so firstly, I would just uh, say Adrian, he made really nice like uh, comments. So I will just take it from there. So for example, when he said like water reusage of water. So for, from technology point of view, is it like, so for example, uh, if I give you example, agriculture, obviously because I worked with lots of like with indoor farming and agriculture. So currently 70% of fresh water is used in agriculture all around the world. But out of that 60 percent get wasted so now i mean here technology can play its role so for example this substrate our hydro the material we are using so basically what will happen it will save water at least like 70 80 percent like so it won't get wasted so this is more like reusage of uh, water uh, because again you can't like uh, bring like water from one city to another city it's it's more like how to efficiently use like um to save it. And then uh, the policy makers where it comes is like, so unfortunately, because what is happening, uh, there are, I mean, there are lots of good work is going on from government, but what it's, it's like people are looking for temporary solution. So technology, when you develop something, so lots of time as a scientist, like obviously it's, it's slightly expensive. So for example, there are like lots of technologies available in market, which will be, it's a, just an example. It will cost two pound. And then the new technology, it will be probably four pound. So here, I mean, a government and policymaker, when they will think like temporary, they will be like, okay, it's expensive. So we won't, don't want to invest. We don't want to do uh, things big, and they will rule out like uh, those things. But if they think in a longer term, so after 30 years, if we invest, if we give like, so it's a slightly different uh, probably uh, to topic, like can we give subsidy? So for example, where I'm in like, so there are different countries like India, if I give you example of India and Pakistan. So there are lots of, I mean, if you have greener technology, there is a certain subsidy. So if it's expensive, you can sell things at four pound, but then government give you two pound. So these are the kind of thing I mean, and again, uh, as a scientist, it's our responsibility when we talk with policymaker, we need to make sure that it's, it's not like we don't use like technical jargons we explain in a nicer way like okay it's just like easy to understand so that it just can click and go uh, and then they are happy to invest like so this is something yeah I can see others nodding so is there anyone that wants to kind of come in and build on some of those points yeah Adrian so just to add to that, I think technology has a real value, the sort of things that Christina was highlighting and Benicia as well. It's a double-edged sword sometimes though, as well, because it's often about how we use technology. Technology brings its own challenges. We, we all know that, I think. Sometimes we become a bit complacent because our technology says that we're safe from there as well. Um, you know, there are all sorts of uh, studies from the insurance industry uh, around how you know, drivers may drive more dangerously when they're insured. Um, because they feel that they're protected at one level or another. So I think how society uses technology is one of the key questions here. And there was a, there was a, there was a challenge. We are very keen to see socioeconomic development for, for reasons of health, for well-being, uh, for prosperity. And I think those are very good things. But that can also come at a cost from there. And that's not ne necessarily a negative, but it's again a question of the values that we want to apply in different places as well. And that's where I think these conversations need to really take place, to see technology as, as one input into the complex systems that Eva was talking about earlier. You know, we don't really know how the outcomes are going to emerge because of this complex interplay of different activities. So one of the elements here is really about staying on top of this and thinking about well, what are we really trying to achieve? Is it about tomorrow? Is it about five years time? Is it about the UK or wider geography? 
And actually, what I really like is some of the conversations that are going on in England at the moment around future generations. You know, in Wales, we've had a Future Generations Act for, for a number of years. There are other geographies that also begin to think about this as well. And thinking about how that technology might promote and support the well-being of future generations in the activity and the actions that we take now, I think is perhaps the most important question that we can ask. Well, I wanted to open it up actually about timescales because in relation to this topic, what, what do you all see as the critical timescale? And you know, why is the time to act now? Um, assuming that's kind of what you think, but I, I would be kind of welcome your thoughts on that timescale element. So I kind of open it up to um, you all to comment on that. I don't know if um, Katie, you want to go first. I think I think future generations is incredibly important and that we we have that and there's a lot of um, thinking about future generations and a lot of indigenous communities and theologies that's very important to, uh, that we can borrow from and can help inform a lot of the kind of techno focus that we see in um, uh, technical techno solutions kind of um, discourse we see in the climate change field. I think there's a real urgency now because climate change is not just uh, slow onset. This is being felt um, by a lot of communities on the front line. Um, and Adrian said it really beautifully and, 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 and my other um, panelists have also touched on that, that what society are we trying to build? And we're trying to avoid maladaptation. We're trying to ensure that if we act now, that our, our climate actions, our adaptation processes can be transformative. And that's something that we're really aiming to do is to take the knowledge from communities um, and those inequalities that we're understanding um, and looking for gender transformative climate actions. So these are promoting um, adaptation, um, reducing inability to, to, to adapt um, and decreasing vulnerability, while also actively tackling inequalities, because those are happening today, tomorrow to, to, to many different people. And, that is, and it is life and death. And it's, um, it's, it's, it's impacting people at, at every level on, on health, on access to resources, access to land, access to swimming lessons um, for you know, the next typhoon coming in. Um, so how do, we, how do we tackle these inequalities? But to tackle them, we need to understand them better. Um, and we need to understand that as an individual. I need to understand how that is happening in my lecture room. I need to understand how that's happening in the office up the road, what's happening in the COVID vaccination center, um, as well as understanding you know, what's happening kind of on more of a societal level. So we need to be really going kind of bottom up and top down when we're, we're, we're acting now um, and, and preferably yesterday, actually. <laughs> Um, Aoife. Thanks, Sam. Um, um, yeah, I think this goes back to um, some of what Binish was saying about um, the, the role of government for, for new technologies, um, because I think um, it's really important that um, government has a role in thinking about this the long term, and that's why this kind of focus on future generations that um, both Adrian and, and Katie have mentioned is so um, is so critical. It's very difficult for individual actors to, to have this long-term systemic focus. Um, and I think that's exactly what we need right now, even though we also need to urgently act individually. So it's this com combination of the two that we have to have this very um, long-term vision 2050 is in everybody's minds. Um, that's a number that is also not always that helpful, right? So we're talking about getting to net zero globally um, by 2050. And um, that means, um, and translating that into, for different um, industries, sectors, and different geographies is really important work that we need to do now. Um, and I think there needs to be much more of a focus on um, translating um, this um, number and the percentages and the degrees um, that we need to reach um, for um, different um, people, different communities, um, different businesses. Um, and I think we still have a lot of work to do um, to, to make sure that we are um, combining the short term and this um, and the long term um, actions um, from, from different types of, 
um, different types of actors. Um, and I think one kind of long-term um, issue that we are, um, we need to act about on now, um, or we won't have an option um, in the future is also new areas like carbon removals. Um, and that's, an, that's a very key um, area where governments are um, need to invest now, um, need to take some of the risks that um, Benicia mentioned about new technologies, um, and, and nature-based solutions so that we can actually um, have those solutions developed when we really need them. Um, so that's, um, and that, that comes along with many different, um, different problems and, um, and controversies. And it's important that we're um, aware of those and engaging with people um, to, um, to make sure that we're taking lots of um, the local knowledge that Katie referred to into account. Yeah, I think that's, that's a really good thought there because I, I'm thinking as well with Christina from your perspective, from cities and timescales because you you know unless you're building a new city you are restricted to the city and the infrastructure that exists so in some ways you have another factor to consider when you're thinking about time um time scales but um yeah and from your thoughts i think it's important to think in the short term and in the long term so in the short term identifying what are the biggest sources of pollution and what can we do about them right now so Stepping away from our dependence on coal for energy production, great. Um, and also cities looking at implementing clean air zones to tackle where they have issues with air pollution. That's a, that's a solution that's going to have impact now. Um, but we also need to have these long-term ideas. And so um, moving to electric cars is going to help solve our local transport um, problems, but also thinking about alternative fuels for global shipping is going to be really important um, and in our energy generation. So yeah, short and long together, I think is going to be very important. Mm. Yeah, Benish? Um, so I will just add like, uh, for me, I mean, it's time to act now rather than it's really uh, late. And for me, the major things, one of our panelists, you mentioned about carbon removal. So that is the most like important thing uh, for me as well, because if we want to achieve like certain things in shorter or long term, the most important emphasis from my side is like uh, to develop kind of technology that can reduce like greenhouse gases emission because at the moment uh, temperature is increasing everywhere and all of us like not only uh, in UK but all around the world we can see like uh, because of global warming there is like a loss of issues happening not only about like food it's also with water because by 2030 half of the pop world population will be living in water stressed areas so we need it is from my side it's more like more technologies and those technologies that are like it's again i mean if i go back to adrian so where so those technologies are they are easy to use so we need some uh, tech, we need to develop kind of technologies that not only improve the living, but also uh, it doesn't impact the environment. So for example, if we are developing something that save water or something uh, that removes carbon or like uh, it reduce greenhouse gas emission. So will it, if will it has other negative effects or not? So for me, I mean, it's more like in some rates, greenhouse gas emission that we should think about like in shorter and longer term. Yeah, Adrian, your thoughts on? Yeah, just very briefly, Sam. I, th I like your point about the uh, recognizing the legacy of our existing infrastructure, uh, and that's really important, particularly where you've got a very well, long established uh, infrastructural context. Things happen at different paces, and I, I, I think we all have a, an agreement about the importance of acting now for the future, the importance of dealing with some of the everyday risks and problems that, that people are facing. One of the challenges, of course, is the timescales which individuals hold in their minds and governments hold in their minds as well. Because if governments are slow to act, then the risk is that individuals will act in their own right. And we can see this, as I said, from some of the cities that I'm working in, in, in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, in Cape Town, during the drought, people started to drill their own boreholes. They'd never drilled boreholes there before, but they wanted access to water. They were concerned about the future natural thing to do. So I think sometimes we can be, you know, we can lose control 
of a system, we can be driven forward. We can see some of that happening with the, with the COVID experience over the last 18 months as well. But equally, sometimes governments can try to move too quickly for society as well. And one of the reasons for acting now is because it takes time to change mindsets. Think how long it took us to make smoking see, to be seen as a, a kind of maybe not a great thing to do from there. These things take time. And if we don't start now and, and work together on this, then, then actually we'll be in a real difficult situation. But I think we also, and this is my final point on this, I think we also have to be willing to think differently. Just going back to, to my own understanding, there's only, I only have a limited knowledge of this, but in the UK, our water supply infrastructure, in terms of its regulation, in terms of its infrastructure, it was founded 200 years ago. It's not changed significantly in that time. And one of the challenges of adaptation is it's incremental. And sometimes there has to be a question about, well, actually, are we being held in by our, by our, by our unwillingness to break away from the models of the past? And maybe we should be thinking differently as well. And that, I think, is where government has a real role alongside other groups who are trying to get these conversations going. Yeah, there's some really good challenges that we face there, actually, like you say, um, the, it's such a critical part, you, you, you take for granted that our, that utilities infrastructure is there, but it's actually very critical and you don't want it to go wrong either. <laughs> um, so I was, we're kind of starting to reach the end and I wanted to ask the panel um, what they hope the legacy of their work to be. Everybody joining us today is doing some really exciting work um, through their fellowships or through other routes. And I'll, I'll go back around the other way um, and ask you, what, what do you hope your legacy to be through the work that you're doing? So I'll start with you, Adrian, and we'll go backwards. <laughs> okay, I, I think very simply, Sam, it, it's a recognition of the role of individual actors in shaping resilience outcomes, but also the role of government or governance more generally, perhaps, in, in seeking to shape that. So as a very fast example, I was really impressed in Cape Town um, how their water resilience strategy, which they've developed since the drought, is now much more inclusive. It seeks the inputs and the views of residents, it identifies priorities, uh, promotes the ownership of actions and, and the water use that people have as well. Uh, and I think it's fair to say that those sorts of conversations about water strategy in the UK haven't yet happened, not, not largely. So I think that would be a great legacy to come mm -hmm. forward. Excellent, Benish. Sorry, uh, so from my side, it is more like it's again uh, from food related, like sustainable uh, way. So what I'm thinking like, it's just like once we are done with our research, once our product is in market, then it's more like how to have like our food more in a sustainable way. And I just want to add one point, probably it is not on that side from Adrian again. So why, I mean, people don't adopt technology like uh, as soon as, so he gave example of infrastructure. So for example, uh, we are interacting with a company, so their revenue is 20 million. So they love our technology, they like it, but they will, it will take them two years to adopt it. The reason why, why is the reason they know these are the benefits. They don't have like money to invest on infrastructure. So that is for me, one of the major barrier, like not by individual, but just from companies or from, it's just like the lack of investment, lack of money uh, to invest in new technology. So people are just happy, like we got something, we don't want to invest on new things. So it's just like that is like. Yeah, that's a good point. That is a good challenge that we do face. Um, Christina? For me, I think it's going to be important to take responsibility for how air pollution um, comes from different sources, but has eventual impact on our personal exposure and health. And by understanding that whole process, we can take control and and have an impact on our health fundamentally. Excellent, and Aoife, your thoughts? 
Um, so I think for me, it's about um, the the importance of thinking differently about the role of business. Um, so I think businesses, just like governments, need to think differently about um, what they're doing, how they're doing it, um, because they are part of existing systems, and those systems in some ways need to be disrupted um, quite radically. Um, and um, all of my work is focused on this changing the way that we think about um, doing business. Um, and um, in ways that will connect with a lot of the things that we've talked about today, um, connecting with what we actually want um, as a society and um, what communities want and what they need. And Katie? Uh, I think radically disrupting systems is a, a, would be a wonderful legacy for, for all of us. Um, for me, it's about centralizing and foregrounding um, those voices that get lost and are invisible at the moment. Um, and creating methods and tools that become really accessible and useful and accepted um, that means that complicated understandings of how these systems work and how this power is, 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 is keeping, keeping oppressions in place, how we allow policymakers and people with power, people who are developing and rolling out technologies, how those people and those actors engage with those with those knowledges and understanding and and um and really kind of bringing arts into that and and bringing arts into a very science dominated um um department that would be um that would be a job well done well thank you everyone um i think from my reflections of today's discussion it just shows as well how much a multidisciplinary approach is needed for these challenges and actually it's I mean, it, it's inspiring, but it's, it can also be overwhelming to think as well of how much we need to do working from the individual to the communities, to businesses, to government and policy. But there is a lot of opportunity. And I think the work you're doing is really inspirational in working towards that. Um, and I, I thank you for being here today. It's been a really good conversation. Um, I think we've summarized we need to act yesterday, today and in the future. So please keep up your research. And Thank you very much for joining us. Um, and for those that are watching, enjoy the rest of the conference this week. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sam. Thank you very much, Sam. Thanks, everybody.